Well, uh, earlier this week, Elaine dropped all of the certificates on my desk to sign for all the parents. And uh, it was just super cool because I kind of got like a hand cramp, you know, just like signing. I think it's, we have like uh, over a dozen families and babies being dedicated. So it's super, super cool being a part of a church that's uh, just continuing to, to see life happen. You know, I want to start by asking you a quick question uh, this morning is, have you ever had something that just never worked the way that it should, right? Show of hands, you ever have something? Okay, on the count of three, I want you to shout out whatever it was that thing was that's just haunted you uh, for part of your life. Okay, on the one, count of three, one, two, three, shout it out. March Madness, <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, yeah, how many of you guys, uh, uh, something that's never worked before was like, a, like an appliance in your home, like it came with the house, okay? Anybody have a car that just never quite fired on all cylinders, you know, literally, figuratively? Uh, early on in college, I had a, a vehicle, it was a 2008 Ford Explorer that uh, basically just made it down the road, but it was never like completely falling apart. Uh, a couple of ways in which this thing just, just seemingly was a gem of a vehicle. It, it was a V8, but it would occasionally skip second gear. And so you'd be flooring it on the highway and it'd be revving. And then all of a sudden it would skip to third gear. And then whoosh, you're just like, it's just pulling you down the road. It had one of those automatic rear windows that would roll down. Uh, but it never would, but then it would just decide to by itself on like a random Tuesday. So you're driving, all of a sudden, wind just starts gushing in. When we picked it up from the dealership, this used car dealership, uh, they had a security device on it that they forgot to take off. And so it was this little key that you would put in uh, to, like, to say, like, yeah, hey, I own this car, but then the key broke. And so you'd have to have one finger on the security device and wiggle it while you turn the ignition. It's like really good touching electrical components with fire and all that type of stuff. And so, uh, so I grew up with this vehicle. The, the whole reason I got it was to transport friends to and from, from the beach in college. And I, uh, one time though, uh, in the state of California, you might not know this, we have to get what's called smog diagnostic tests, you know, smog chest, uh, test. And so you would take your vehicle in and it had to pass all these tests. But there was a, a rule or law that I was unaware of. So I, so I took the vehicle in. The guy goes out to, to check on the Explorer. He comes back out like two minutes later. And he said, hey, I don't know if you know, but there's a law that if the check engine light is on in your vehicle, you automatically fail. And I said, well, bad news for me because it's been on since I've owned the thing type of deal. And he goes, but I can make sure you pass it. And I said, wait, I thought you said if the check engine light, he goes, no, 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 I can make sure you pass it if you want. Are you paying in cash? And I was like, oh, so I'll leave it up to you what I decided to do from that moment. The story, the story is your own. You know, there are some uh, interesting things, some diagnostic tests that, that we have in life. Um, uh, you, you, maybe you go to the doctor every single year. Uh, maybe some of you are like good human beings. You go to the dentist at least once a year. I haven't been in like over a decade uh, type of deal. I just, the dentist irks me out, can't do it. Uh, even in school, every test that you take serves as a sort of diagnostic to kind of say, are you on track? Are you on target? Are you learning, consuming, retaining the things that you ought to? And as we continue in our study through the Gospel of John this morning, we're going to encounter uh, another interaction with John the Baptist. So John the Baptist, the, the writer of John, John the Apostle, not the same guy, but but we're going to see he's kind of getting a check-in on his ministry. It's been some time since he paved the way for Jesus, seemingly probably at least a couple years minimum at this point, and we kind of get a glimpse into John's life and his work and his ministry, and it serves as somewhat of a diagnostic test. You know, uh, Kevin Teal, one of our elders, preached a phenomenal service like two months ago on, on John, and we all have a divine assignment that we've been put on. So I've entitled today's message, A Divine Assignment Diagnostic. And what I want us to look at when we study this text is to see, are you firing on all cylinders? Is your life, your faith, the assignment that God has called you to do, which is to expound the kingdom of God for his glory, not yourself, are you on the right track or not? So if you have a Bible, John chapter 3 this morning, we're going to pick up in, in our text, John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 22. Um, and it has been just a phenomenal last couple weeks. The, the parents promised today Easter services last week were just absolutely incredible. We had over 24 people uh, 
uh, decide to get baptized. We have a couple more uh, coming in this week, one this afternoon. So can we just praise God, a round of applause for all that, that God is doing in the life of our church. Man, it is just so cool uh, to be part of a church that's not just growing, say, numerically, but growing uh, in, in our next steps of obedience today. And so like I said, we're, we're wrapping up chapter three today, and uh, someone came to me uh, uh, this past week, and they, they're, they were trying to share uh, their faith with their coworker, and this, my coworker has, wants to know some basics. Like, what does it actually mean and look like to be a follower of Jesus? And I said to them, you know, honestly, you should probably send them our first two messages uh, in chapter three uh, fr- from this series, not because I preached them, but because that text, the first 21 verses of John chapter three, really set the foundation foundation of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. So if that's you, if you ever find yourself trying to say, hey, I've been talking to my friend, my neighbor about, my, about, about faith, about Jesus, inviting them to church, and they have questions, those two messages serve as a great foundation for you today. So we're wrapping up chapter three today, picking up in verse 22. I hope you brought a pen. We got some good stuff. Uh, if you're there, say there, and we are going to dive into the word of God together today says this, after this, so after uh, the interaction with Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John, this being John the Baptist, also was baptizing at Anah near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man, they're referring to Jesus, who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one who you testified, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. Mark up going to him. To this, John replied, a person can only receive which is given them from heaven, circle from heaven. And you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead. Mark up sent ahead. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends uh, the bridegroom waits and listens. He's basically talking about being the best man of a wedding. Listens for him and is full of, get this, joy. I want you to circle the word joy. When he hears the bridegroom's voice, that joy is mine and it is now complete. Here it is, this key verse for us this morning. He must become greater. I must become less. Everybody say greater. Say less. You know, uh, in mathematics, they've got those little symbols and I don't remember which one is which. All I remember is like an alligator. I think it eats the bigger one. And here's John, he's kind of saying, you guys are catching up on my ministry. You guys are kind of getting a glimpse of what I've been up to. And it's interesting because Jesus is on the scene. At this point, Jesus is performing signs and miracles. He's teaching, he's showing compassion. He is opening up the kingdom of God for anyone and everyone. And John is still at work. It wasn't like Jesus is on the scene. Now John the Baptist is like, okay, cool. Jesus is here. I did my thing. Now I can just kind of coast and let somebody else take care of it. He is still doing his thing. So Jesus is, is, is developing a, a ministry. Hundreds, if not uh, thousands, begin to kind of follow him wherever he is. He's baptizing people over and over and over again. And John is doing the same thing baptizing people and saying, hey, remember, I can't save you. I am here preparing this, this repentance so that you can find Jesus for yourself. And, and, and John's disciples, they come uh, to him and they say, wait a second, John, aren't you a little jealous of Jesus? Aren't you a little envious that he is our surmising, surmising, encompassing, I don't know, all those words don't make sense at this point, I realize, all of these followers that are following you. And in fact, in fact, John, some of your own people who, who you baptized, who you brought into the family of faith are leaving you to go to him. Aren't you a little bummed? Aren't you a little, a little, maybe just a little bit peeved? Maybe just kind of a little bit. And I can imagine at this point, John just kind of laughs it off. Like, oh, you guys, you guys are so, oh, wait, you're serious. <laughs> no, 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 guys, remember I told you. My purpose, the reason I exist on this planet is I exist, my divine assignment has been to prepare and clear the way for Jesus and then to get out of the way so that he might be glorified. 
And he gives them this kind of summation. I like to think of it as John's kind of life motto, his ministry manifest. He must increase. I must decrease. I'm the messenger. He's the Messiah. I'm the person connecting the dots with the line. He is the lamb of God. He is the savior of the world. I was purely sent ahead. And I want you to think about that because that kind of motto, that kind of mindset is something that each and every one of us who claim to be a disciple of Jesus should embody. And while John's kind of ministry motto is he must increase, I must decrease, it applies to us today. We could put, maybe put it this way. If you want to make it more universal for every church, every disciple, is this. And what John's essentially saying is without us, he being God won't do a thing. But without him, we can't do a thing. God has chosen. Sometimes, if I'm being honest, outside of his own uh, good conscience and sovereign and, and omnipotence, omniscience and everything, to use us to further his kingdom. Do you know that? That if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, someone who has believed and you are born again, you have been chosen, you have been set apart. You have been given gifts and things. You have been given the power of the Holy Spirit in you to expand not your kingdom, not your influence, but his. For some reason, God says, I think I want to include my family, my church in the business of taking my name to whoever it is. And that's great news that you have an amazing, eternal, lifelong purpose that you have been called to. But we also need to remember, though, that without him, we can't do a thing. That we cannot make Jesus' name great. We cannot baptize in our own strength. That the only way that Jesus is glorified is by his work in us and through us. And that's where John says, that's my motto. He must increase. I must decrease. You know, every brand has a, has a motto. Every brand, some of them stick a little bit more. So I'm going to give you the motto of a brand, and you just shout it out if you know it, all right? Like a good neighbor, Stay Farm is there. Um, my kids right now, uh, they really, they, if you were to say State Farm is there like a good neighbor, they would say, no, it's Neba. Like you've seen the Arnold Schwarzenegger commercials, Neba. Uh, when I take my, my, my daughter to preschool in, in the mornings and the radio's on and the State Farm radio ad comes on, she's just in the back going, Neba, Neba, Neba. And she even asked me, she goes, Dad, when does the, the State Farm movie come out, right? Because it looks like a movie trailer. And I said, oh, sweetie, uh, we'll let you watch Predator at some point. I don't know. <laughs> it's basically the same thing. Uh, how about this one? Uh, eat more chicken. Chick-fil-A. Why is it that the only day that like you are guaranteed to crave Chick-fil-A is on Sundays? You will leave this building today and someone's going to ask you, what do you want for lunch? And you're going to instinctively say, man, a spicy deluxe chicken sandwich with some Polynesian sauce and a Sun Joy, which is basically an Arnold Palmer, but they got to make it special. I don't know what it is. Chick-fil-A figured out something that Sundays is the day that they're closed that you crave it the most. Uh, how about this one? The happiest place on earth. You know this one? Disney which is kind of true. Like if you're there, but you don't have the wallet, it's the happiest place on earth. But, but if you're there and you're the one paying for everything, you start looking at that bill, it's a little crazy. You know, some people, they have uh, life verses. And I've always been interested uh, about this. It's all these good, nice sounding verses. Every verse in the Bible is good and has its point and its power. But it's always like Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, to give you hope and to make you prosperous. It's a great verse. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then we go bench press as much as we can, right? It's a great verse. I think it's Psalm uh, 37 verse 4. This is, if you delight in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your hearts. I've always wondered why people's life verses aren't things from like James 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. I've never encountered anyone whose life verse was Isaiah 55, verse 8. His thoughts are not mine. His ways are not my way. And it's interesting, if we get to John chapter 3, verse 30, and we get John's kind of life verse, I don't know how many of us would select that one on purpose. He must increase. I must decrease. John's saying, my divine assignment... 
is to be as insignificant in this life as possible so that he might be as significant as possible to anyone who comes. And it's this verse that we look at. It sounds great. It looks great on a coffee mug or you put it over your door or whatever it is. But my question is, is is if that was your life verse, if your life, your ministry, so to speak, that you have been put on divine assignment and you are given a diagnostic, how would you venture? Because I think there are kind of two misfires that happen. If we were to take this verse, I think there are two ways in which maybe our diagnostic might say, you're kind of off track a little bit. Here's the first one. Misfire number one is instead of saying he must increase, I must decrease, we might say he must increase and I must increase. Sometimes we come to this, this conclusion that as I lift up Jesus, he must also lift me up at the same time too. And it's interesting because that's what John's disciples are essentially asking him. Wait a second, John, you've done all of this stuff to lift up the name of Jesus, all of these people, all of these things that you've sent to him. Aren't you a little jealous that he hasn't returned the favor? John had, had, had some reasons for jealousy. He was the older cousin. His dad was a priest. Jesus' dad was not. John was from a more notable town. He came first, he baptized first, he taught first, he sent disciples to Jesus, and Jesus never returned the favor. My point in this is John was no schmuck. It wasn't like he was just like an average guy. Jesus even referred to John the Baptist. There is no one like him in the land. So so Jesus, if Jesus says you're like the greatest human ever, that's a pretty big bar. And it's interesting because John's response to that is he must increase, I must decrease. Not, well, yeah, yeah, I've done a lot of good. And as I've lifted you up, Jesus, you ought to lift me up as well too. And that's when he says, remember, I am sent ahead to prepare the way. I am essentially the best man. And I love this. I wrote, I wrote down, you could write this down, is that, is that John was saying, I am fueled by joy, not filled with jealousy. He said, I'm fueled by joy in making the name of Jesus known, not fueled or filled with jealousy. See, the job of the best man back then was to make sure that the party of the celebration, everything happened without missing a beat. And then as soon as the bride and and groom arrived, as soon as they were put in in their proper place, your job was to then go dark, to be invisible. Like, be really interesting if if you were a best man at a wedding and someone gave you his time for your toast and you clink, 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 clink. Um, Yeah. Can we just give a round of applause for me real quick? I mean, look at this thing. Look at this wedding. The wine's, the wine's insanely good. Man, all this lamb that we've got. I mean, I pulled out. Air conditioning won't be existing for thousands of years, but, man, I figured it out. You guys, you guys are really glad that I'm here, right? Like, that would be super weird for a best man to be like, hey, I'm going to take center stage and detract away from the whole purpose. And that's what John is saying. I was sent ahead to prepare the way I am fueled by joy not filled with jealousy. He must increase. I must decrease. Because when we come to Jesus saying, as you increase in my life, I must also increase, what it's going to do, it's going to breed jealousy. Because there are things that we want that we have not been given. We begin to treat Jesus like a genie. If I scratch your back, Jesus, you scratch mine. As you increase, as I read the Bible more, as I pray more, as I attend more, I even thought about giving for the first time. As I do that, then you gotta, you got to do stuff for me. you got to pick up your end of the bargain. you gotta, you got to assure up some of the things. I've got this circumstance. I've got this relationship. I've got this issue. I've got this person need to heal. That Jesus, if I lift you up, you better lift me up as well too. And what that's going to do, it's going to breed jealousy so that when that doesn't happen, then we're going to say there's something wrong with him. I love how Pastor Craig Groeschel put it. He said uh, this idea about comparison rooted in jealousy. He says, comparison makes you either feel inferior or superior, but neither honors God. That if we believe that as we obediently follow Jesus, then that we too must also increase. We are misfiring on what it means to belong to him and to the family of God. What we're essentially saying is, Jesus, if I do something for you, you better do something for me. 
I'm not going to remember the way in which you died on a cross. I'm not going to remember in which you came to this life. You left your seat in heaven and you embodied human life and you lived perfectly. I'm going to forget all of that because Jesus, what this is about is you increase, I increase. That's the way it works. And John says the way in which we fight back that jealousy in our life is to remember that we are the best man. We are never the bridegroom. That you are the maid of honor. You are never the bride when it comes to the kingdom of God. That you exist to prepare the way for his kingdom and his glory and his name, not your own. That's misfire number one. Misfire number two, we might kind of flip this. And we say, I must increase, he must decrease. The second way I think sometimes uh, we might be misfiring in this divine assignment diagnostic is to say, I need to be lifted up. Jesus said, what you need to do is you need to lift me up and then you slide into the shadows, you slide into the background. What I mean by this is that sometimes we we think it's Jesus' job to make our life easier, more comfortable, or better based on our terms. Jesus, you exist to lift me up. That's the whole point of faith, right? Is what we convince ourselves. I increase, you decrease. You come through, you do the things I need you to do. And if you don't, you decrease. In fact, I would really like it if you just, just wave your magic, uh, did, you know, Bible dust everywhere. You make my life super nice and kind and easy and without pain. And everything is comfortable and I never miss, but whatever it is. And then you just kind of go back to, to the existing where and I'll put you in this box and I'll get you out when I need you. You see, if the first misfire causes jealousy, and th- in a weird way, and kind of a similar but very different, is this misfire causes envy. You see, what envy is, is when we focus on what we don't have and we consider it necessary to be satisfied. Um, I'm going to use this, this Rubik's Cube uh, here and then at the end of my, my message today. But so, quick story. I, I picked this up. I brought it home. I only have one. I got two kids. And this is a toy, right? Some of you kind of understand how this works. I brought it home, put it on the counter. Uh, my, my daughter got to open it out of the package. My son came up. He goes, where's my Rubik's Cube? So well, I only need one. He said, well, why does Avery get one? And I said, because I only need one. And he's like, wait, wait, he had his heart. And so then all of a sudden they began to fight over a Rubik's Cube. They don't even know how it works. They don't even know the whole point of a Rubik's Cube, what it does. They take it and they just start mixing it. And I was like, no, no, I will never get it perfect again. I am a moron. I don't know how to do one of these. Like, like this isn't going to work. And they take, and because one of them got one, the other kid decided, I must also get one in order to be completely satisfied in this life. The crazy part is like 30 seconds later, I was like, you guys want some candy? And they're like, yeah. And then they never thought about the Rubik's Cube again. It's the way that toddler dumb works. And when it comes to I must increase, he must decrease, we get envious. Because we think we know what we need to be satisfied Everybody else is cutting corners. Everybody else isn't. But I know what you need to give me, Jesus, in order for this life to make sense. Well, Jesus, you're not the one giving me what I want. So therefore, you don't love me. Jesus, you're not the one meeting all my needs and my heart's desires. Therefore, you're not good and you're not kind. That's a, I must increase, he must decrease. Jesus, you're, you're holding back. You're being stingy. What's going on here? That's why John the Baptist says in verse 27, a person can only receive what is given to them from where? From heaven, from above. Here's the truth that I need you to get this morning. Please, please, please listen, lean in. Everything you have in this life is on loan from God in heaven. Your job It was a gift from God. Your home was a gift from God. Your income is a gift from God. Your family is a gift from God. Your stuff, your things, your clothes, your items, your your, your dishwasher who makes weird noises and it doesn't always work all the time. It doesn't, that is a gift from God. And when we take a I must increase, he must decrease approach. We began to think, no, no, all of this is mine. 
Everything you have is on loan from God. The breath in your lungs, the fact that you are alive today, is the fact that your life is on loan from a heavenly father who loves you, who cares about you, who desires to put you on divine assignment. And if we approach our life motto to say, Jesus, your job is to make my life easy and comfortable, we begin to forget that everything we have comes from above. Everything we have comes from above, which means it belongs to him. So that as he calls for it, as he says, this is where I need you to be obedient, this is what I need you to surrender, we listen, we obey, because it is not ours. It is his. And the way we fight off envy is by not getting more or hoarding more. As the scripture teaches, by giving away and stewarded all that God has gifted us. Misfire one, he increase, I increase, breeds jealousy. Jealousy is when our hands are never, or when our full hands, we never want empty. Misfire number two, I must increase, he must decrease. That's envy. It's empty hands that we always want full. And what John says, he must increase, I must decrease is humility, which is empty hands we never want full because we know it's not about us. So what does that look like? I want to read our our, our final part of chapter 3 and then leave us with three uh, diagnostic questions as we close out this morning. So picking back up in verse 31. It says, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from this earth belongs to the earth and the one who speaks from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is indeed truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God for God, get this, gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. John's kind of divine, John the Baptist's divine assignment to clear the way, prepare the way, get out of the way. I want to remove as many obstacles for people to know and to follow the Messiah. All people, doesn't matter who they are, where they're from, what their past looks like. I'm going to call anyone and everyone. I'm going to share my testimony, share my story. I'm going to baptize anyone into that name, but then I'm going to let Jesus take center stage. So what about you? The divine assignment that you have been given as a follower of Jesus, if you have chosen to follow Jesus, how are you doing? Here's three diagnostic questions that you can write down and ask yourself. Number one, who and what belongs to who? Proper English, I don't know if it's whom or not. I just think whom sounds fancy. I don't know when do you really use it. So if you're an English person, my apologies if that's the way I ought to read. But number one, How do you view everything in this life? Who and what belongs to who in this life? Verse 31, 33 gives somewhat of a reality check. The one from above is from above. The one from the earth is from the earth. The stuff that's from above comes from above. It serves as, as a reality check to kind of put us down to size. That we are measly people. We live a blip on this earth that is a, a, a microcosm of eternity. And and essentially what John the Apostle is kind of saying, he said, how dare you think that everything that you have is yours? Your own life isn't yours. You don't even know the day that you're going to die. You don't know when you're going to take your last breath. You couldn't make the money that you make if it wasn't for God giving you those skills and those talents and the ability to live. And so being able to be humble before God, to be cut down to size, to say, God, everything in this life belongs to you. Every single person I come into contact with is a, is a loved son and daughter created in the image of God to know you and to follow, follow you. Is the first question to want to know how we're actually doing in our divine assignment. Who serves at whose pleasure? Whose stuff belongs to who? Who gets to call the shots? Is it you or him? Who does your, who does your income belong to? Truly. Who does your house belong to truly? Your stuff, your skills, your schedules, who does it belong to truly? Second question, 
Is the spirit at work or is it at rest in you? This was the question that, that rocked my soul as I was preparing this message. It comes from the, that God gives the spirit without limit. And I remember getting down in my office and praying, asking God, God, are you at work or are you at rest in my life? And he says, depends. Depends. Depends if you're going to listen. Depends if you're going to obey. Depends if you're going to give that thing I've required. There's definitely times in which he's at work, but I am the one who chooses whether or not to let him work or to put him at rest. He gives the spirit without limit. The word spirit is this word that means guide. It's this word that means advocate. The, 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 the spirit of God advocates to remind you that you are saved by grace and grace alone because you are loved by Jesus Christ, but it also serves as a guide to show you how to live this born again life. To put it this way, is the Spirit doesn't just want to save you, He also wants to sanctify you, to make you into a good work that does good works. And my question to myself and my question to you is, are you listening? Are you following? Is the Spirit, are you letting it have its way in your life? Are you being molded and shaped by the truth and the Spirit of God, or have you put it to rest? Because you believe you call the shots. I I fear for those who claim Christ, but they live okay with the fact that the Spirit is at rest within them. You know, I I would venture to guess that the Spirit has been speaking to you for some point, some time. But are you listening? You know, I recently had the privilege to talk to like a half dozen people from our church who are strongly considering giving up their career in something that's, you know, effective, influential, because they feel like they need to to leave that behind so they can focus on their life with God. I was talking to a buddy of mine that I went to college with. Uh, it's, It's sobering for me. It breaks my heart that a lot of people who get into ministry, who leave ministry, oftentimes want nothing to do with God or the church after. I was talking to one of my good buddies. It had been about 10 years since I've actually seen him. He was in ministry. He was a student pastor for a handful of years. And then he started this business. It's blowing up. Uh, he's down in Nashville. And I was talking. I was like, man, how are you, like, how are you doing? You know, I was, was live. He's not married yet, any of this type of stuff, which is fine. It's okay. And he's, you know, he, he's going through all that. And then I just asked him the question. I said, I said how are you and Jesus? He says, actually, like, we're, we're really good. I said, okay, like what's, you know, one of my favorite questions, what's Jesus been teaching you? We're going into that and stuff. And then he says, you know what? I've been convicted for two years now. He said, Eric, I was in ministry. I know that, that my job depended on the tithes and offerings of others. He said, for two years now, I have not given a single dollar to my local church. And I said to him, I said, okay, so why are you bringing this up? He said, because you wanted to know what the spirit has been, been convicting me to do. And I said, okay, well, why haven't you done it yet? Why haven't you done it yet? And so because I said, but you know full well that when you hold back your money from, from your, that church, you are holding back the kingdom of God from expanding. You, you are holding back the opportunity for more ministry and opportunity for people to know and find and love Jesus. She's like, I know, I just need to do it. And I said, I get it. It's a tough surrender for a majority of people. Majority of you statistically in the room do not give a single dime to this church. Did you know that? And it's just one of these things where it's like, man, the Spirit has made it abundantly clear what you need to do to be faithful to him. And maybe it is for the first time you need to open up that checkbook and you need to give because this church that you call home, the amount of people who show up, and we love that you're here, but you're holding back and the Spirit is convicting you've chosen not to do it. Maybe the Spirit has been working in you saying, you know that relationship that does not honor me? You know the way in which you speak to your wife that does not honor me? You know the way in in, in which the way that that you schedule and you prioritize your thing, the message you're sending, you know how that doesn't honor me? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to stuff it, put it at rest, or are you going to listen and follow? It's crazy because all throughout Scripture, every single person who follows God in the New Testament, almost every single person, that we know a lot about, their life doesn't end well. It's not a surprise. 
And yet they do it because they are fueled by joy, not filled with jealousy. Not thinking about what they have or don't have in this life. Because they know that there is an eternal kingdom at stake. And it's oftentimes our lack of obedience that holds us back from that divine assignment for the people that you love and that you care about who you will not see in heaven. Because you have chosen to not let the Spirit do its work in you and through you, whatever that may be. And I say this because I love you. But I also say this because I want this church to be a place in which the name of Jesus is known and lifted up like never before. And when we take the Spirit of God and we get okay and comfortable with not letting it mold us and shape us, what we're really doing is what we're really saying is my assignment on this life is more important than the one that Jesus has in store for me. Third question. Sorry, I'm kind of fired up. Where do you find comparison in your life? John the Baptist says, I can pair my divine assignment, not to the Pharisees, not to my followers, not to the other prophets, but what Christ has asked of me. And what I want you to know this morning, sorry for my rant, actually I'm not sorry, is there is a good form of comparison when it comes to the kingdom of God. And the comparison that I think a lot of us get trapped in is we compare our old life to our new life, our old struggles with sin to our current struggles with sin. We compare what somebody else is doing to what I'm doing. Sometimes, and I don't know if it's like super theologically correct, we compare our good works to the perfection of Christ and it makes us kind of sad or bummed or depressed. Let me tell you that there is a good form of healthy comparison in the kingdom of God. You ready for it? You compare your sin, your brokenness, your wretchedness to the cross of Christ. You compare who you are and who you used to be to the gracious goodness, love of Jesus Christ because nothing compares. And you let that comparison be your fuel for joy. Like John said, I am on to sign because I am fueled by joy because I know I've been placed on this life, this planet with a purpose. And that purpose is not to make my name great, but to make his. So compare, just don't compare your old life to your new life unless it's the old life of sin to the new life in Christ. But the Bible says you don't put new wine in old wineskins. You compare your sin to the cross of Christ. You compare your brokenness to the blood of Jesus. You compare your wretchedness to the victory that Jesus has granted each and every one of us. Where are you comparing? Are you comparing what you have to your neighbor? Are you comparing uh, your, your comfort to your desire? Are you comparing your blessings to what you want to have versus what you don't? Or are you comparing the life that you have now been given to Jesus? I told you I'd bring back the Rubik's Cube and I wanna share it with this way. Think about this, I know those three things might sound super churchy, so I wanna give you this illustration as we get ready for communion. There was a person who created the Rubik's Cube. I didn't do the history, didn't look it up. But somebody said, here's a great idea for a toy. Let me, let me create it. And then he also, did you know that there is a pattern, there is a way to solve this. You look at, I don't know, one or two sides and then you spin all the way down the line. Like I said, I'm a Warren. I don't know how to do it. Some of you, you know. The thing is, is by owning a, a Rubik's Cube, I don't get to go around and say, look what I created. Look what I did. No, no, somebody else created it. Somebody else had a plan and I have two options. If I wanna solve this, I could just spin and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin and spin, probably forever and never luck out enough to get there. Or I can learn the pattern and the solution given to me by the creator of the Rubik's Cube. Here's the second thing I wanna say is I could have this Rubik's Cube. It could sit on my desk, sit on my shelf, and I could listen to all the podcasts and watch all the YouTube videos and theorize the best and fastest way. I could watch those people, like those like super geniuses who look at it, close their eyes, they do it behind their back in like 30 seconds. You seen that? Look it up. It's great. It's wild. It makes me feel really bad about myself, but it's cool. And I could talk all I want about it, but the thing, if I want to solve it, I have to actually 
pick it up. And I got to practice the solution, the rhythms that are needed in order to solve it. And here's the third part. I don't compare my speed to how slow or fast I used to be. All I think about is what is the next move I need to make? And so that's what I want to set us up with as we enter into our time of communion. When you think about your divine assignment that God has placed in your life, what is your next step? You didn't create it. You can spin your wheels trying to figure it out or you can trust his plan, his process, his solution. You can talk about it all you want. You can watch videos or listen to other people theorize as much as you want. But I would venture to guess You want to pick it up and practice for yourself. But what you need to do is figure out what is your next step to live on that divine assignment. It might be a big step. Maybe it is to start giving for the first time. Maybe that step is to join one of our DMCs, a group or a cohort, because you need to to surround yourself with others. You might be here today and the step that you have been putting off is that you know there is a relationship that you need to end. There's another person that you need to walk out on because you know it is not glorifying, edifying to the name of Jesus Christ. Your next step could be something small. Maybe it's that neighbor. Yeah, I'd love to come to church with you sometime. You just yeah, yeah, yeah. You just never get around. You just haven't asked him. Maybe it's to reprioritize your schedule so that Jesus is centerfold, not just leftovers. I don't know what it is. But I want to venture to guess that the Spirit is at work in you right now, leading and teaching you things that you need to know to live on divine assignment for His glory. I want First Christian Church not to be filled with a bunch of church attenders, no, disciples on mission who know why they are here to make the name of Jesus known. Will you let the Spirit speak to you? And will you have the boldness and the courage to act in that step. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Pray for our kids' ministry volunteers right now as this message has gone long. Give them extra patience, forgiveness for me. (laughs) Jesus, break our heart. Show us, reveal to us, convict us. Be at work in us without limit so that we can live on assignment that gives you and you alone the highest praise, the highest glory. Shame we pray.